Hi, I'm Britt Garner. And I'm Rob Spall. Welcome to Nature Insight. Speed dating with the future. This is our weekly opportunity to lift the veil on the science and policy of biodiversity, giving us all the chance to understand the importance and relevance of this work. So this week, we're having a look at aliens. No, not the extraterrestrial kind, but the terrestrial and aquatic type that are here living and thriving among us. This month, IPPIS launched its report on invasive alien species, which is the first ever global synthesis on this scale. The report examines the drivers, types, and impacts of species moved by people on their new habitats and ecosystems. It also offers a range of options and actions to successfully tackle these challenges. Now, these introduced species contribute to biodiversity loss globally, and the threats they pose have continued to rise around the world. In fact, late last year, the newly agreed Global Biodiversity Framework set a specific target for the world to, quote, eliminate, minimize, reduce, or mitigate the impacts of invasive alien species on biodiversity and ecosystem services. One of the most positive parts of the new Global Biodiversity Targets is exactly how specific they are. The one that you mentioned gets even more concrete. It commits governments to, and again, quoting here, reduce the rates of introduction and establishment of invasive alien species by at least 50% by 2030, and that's a really ambitious target. But for those of us not familiar with the subject as a whole, let's break it down. What are we actually talking about here when we talk about invasive alien species? Right. It's a really good question and place to start because there's two major pieces here. We have the invasive part, so the fact that we have the species causing harm in some way, usually to humans, but also to ecosystems and non-human species as well. Mm -hmm. And then there's also the alien part or the introduced or non-native part, which is just saying that, you know what, this is something that does not usually live in this area. And in the case of invasive alien species, almost always due to human behavior or transportation in some way. Give us a couple of examples, I mean, so we can make this even more real. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, many species that are labeled invasive are, are pretty noticeable. For example, Japanese knotweed that spread throughout fields and gardens in Western Europe. Yeah. Sometimes it's really obvious. <laughs> I grew up in Florida where we have several introduced python species that have become a problem in the Everglades National Park, which is itself an at-risk ecosystem. You know, besides just terrifying, the human populations nearby, (laughs) the non-human issue with these reptiles is how much and what they eat. They can eat endangered birds and other Floridian wildlife, sometimes in, in massive numbers. People have actually been out to literally hunt these pythons. Uh, Just recently, someone was filmed trapping one of the longest pythons ever captured in Florida. Oh Oh, my God! Oh my God! Let's go! Britt, I later found out that that was over five and a half meters in length. So I'm going to guess they were surprised by the scale of the problem. Yep. See what you did there. Thank you. (laughs) Not a fan. (laughs) If you want to talk about the size or the scale of this challenge with, in general, just introduced species is actually bigger than it usually appears just because a lot of the damage and cost that mainly happens to people, but also biodiversity at large is often with species that don't make headlines or have ridiculous <laughs> videos to capture their existence. And Britt, when we talk about the size of the problem again, I mean, it, it also takes me back to the fact that the report that we're talking about here on, on invasive alien species was also almost correspondingly a massive task. Oh, absolutely. I mean, what was it? More than 80 experts from about 50 countries working for more than four years. And at the end of the day, this is an assessment that's more than 800 pages. So who are we going to be talking to about this today? So we're going to speak to Professor Helen Roy, who's the co-chair of the IPIS assessment on invasive alien species. As I found out, this is a subject that has always captivated her.
since being a tiny child, I've always been fascinated in the natural world. And I was this child who was rummaging around in the garden looking for things and particularly interested in the the small things in life, the little insects and um, plants and the interactions amongst these different species. And after studying biology at university, I my PhD on community ecology. So this was just a dream for me, spending my time just exploring and getting excited about the ways in which different species interact with one another. And I was particularly fascinated by ladybirds or ladybugs or lady beetles, as they're called variously around the world. And these are little beetles, often brightly coloured, often spotty, and um, have been used in biological control, for instance, for controlling um, pest insects. And then this ladybird arrived in the UK, the harlequin ladybird, Harmonia axaridis. And this ladybird took me on my journey to biological invasions because it is a species that's native to Asia, but had been introduced into a number of places around the world as a biological control agent to pest insects. And it spread and um, has essentially become a global invader. It's so interesting that you speak about global invasions, and yet it's sort of the local invasion or the local species or experience that kind of gets us started. I know for me, growing up in Florida in the United States, uh, that's where invasion ecology became part of what I was doing. Uh, the Burmese pythons and the Everglades, I worked with those. And, and really seeing something in a system that you know and love uh, really kind of opens the door, I think, to it. And speaking of local, not only do you work globally, but you actually maintain a watch list for UK species. Um, can you give us a story behind that? So within um, the UK, there are a number of species that are designated as being really important ones that we want to have information about very rapidly. Some of these species are currently absent from the UK, but could arrive and um, others are in limited distribution and there would be concern if they began to spread. So one of those, for example, is the Asian hornet or the yellow-legged hornet. And um, this is a species that arrived in France and has spread really rapidly through France and into a number of other European countries. And it's currently absent from the UK, but obviously it's only a short flight across from France and it could arrive and it also hitchhikes in a whole variety of different ways. And so that's one of our species, for instance, that is on that alert list, as we call it. We do a lot of promotion around those species and raise awareness with people around the importance of reporting them if they see them. And it's been really inspiring to see the ways in which people have got involved. So, for example, with the Asian hornet, people are sending in their sightings of concern. Often they're European hornets, but it means that the few some that we get that are actually the Asian hornet, there can be some direct action taken. So it's really fantastic to see the ways in which people can make a real difference. And not only make a difference, but sort of inspire that love of observation, that love of discovery, and finding out about the species that are in our own systems, in our backyards, um, whether those are native or non-native. I think that there's so much there to inspire that idea of, of old school naturalism, of just getting to watch and see what's around us. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I, I think, so I'm also, as a volunteer, I run a ladybird survey, perhaps that's no surprise after what I've just been saying, <laughs> um, for the UK. So we we track all 47 species of ladybird that are found um, within the UK, including the harlequin ladybird. And I just really love the stories that people have to tell about their encounters with different species, about the discoveries that they make on their doorstep. And so this is a fantastic way to also raise awareness about the actions that people can take to make a real difference when we're facing such massive environmental issues, such as biological invasions. In speaking of environmental issues and the kind of importance of learning about this, we have the global uh, assessment, this multiple year Herculean endeavor to research and then communicate about invasive species from IPBIS. And you are an integral part of this assessment. Why do we need an assessment on just this topic? Biological invasions were identified in a previous IPBIS assessment as one of the five main drivers of biodiversity loss 
So alongside climate change, pollution, land and sea use change and over-exploitation, biological invasions are up there in causing some really substantive problems to biodiversity and ecosystems. And this is the first huge synthesis of information on biological invasions. And for me, it's just been an immense privilege and an immense pleasure um, to be involved and to work with such an incredible team of experts. But it is really important. It's a really important assessment in terms of raising awareness, really putting biological invasions, so to speak, on the map, but also presenting some real options for what can be done going forward. Can you tell us a little bit about just maybe some aims or overall objectives of this assessment? As an assessment team, we're buzzing with the excitement to be sharing all of our findings in the coming months, and and we can't wait to do that. But just as a very, very broad overview, we have um, six chapters. We have a chapter on trends. We have um, a chapter on um, the drivers and a chapter on um, the impacts of biological invasions. We have a Herculean chapter on um, management and then a final chapter looking at future options. We also have compiled the information from that into a summary for policymakers, which I have to have to say has the most amazing, I think, visualizations within it as well. So I hope that people are going to really enjoy that and see how we've brought to life the huge number of um, references that we have read. I think it's 13,000 references that we've compiled within this report some of the assessment was done, the majority of this work, during uh, lockdown, during COVID, on Zoom, throughout the pandemic. What was that like? Um, Was there something that surprised you? Tell us a little bit about that kind of process. We had our first author meeting in Japan, and that was an opportunity for the whole team to meet with one another. The 86 experts all got together in Japan, and it was really fantastic to have that opportunity to have an in-person meeting. And that was in 2019. Of course, by 2020, many of us were in lockdown. And so our second author meeting was an online meeting over eight days, covering all the time zones as much as we possibly could do. And uh, yeah, and it sounds, you know, you think eight days on Zoom. And we were really, really keen that we would have that social experience as well throughout it. And so we would have coffee breaks together. Uh, We had a Spotify playlist, which is publicly (laughs) available, uh, an ITBES IAS playlist, including one song from Genesis, The Return of the Giant Hogweed. So we had a fantastic playlist. We also had a, a WhatsApp channel where we were sharing pictures from our windows of where we were. And also we just had a number of pets walking through it various times a lot of cats um, quite a number of dogs and um, I just think what an inspiring team and our technical support unit were just incredible they made us a video at the end so we had a party the same as you would have if you had an in-person meeting we had a video which had a compilation of many of the photos that have been shared on whatsapp and we all um, raised a a glass um, to the end of that second author meeting how cool is that um In general, with this group, do you feel like you all have sort of left this process feeling optimistic uh, about scenarios, about future endeavors? Uh, We have huge optimism across the assessment team, and I think that will really shine through in our summary for policymakers and also through the wider um, assessment in the chapters. We're always thinking about solutions. We've always been thinking about the solutions. Whenever we're encountering one of the problems, we're often then beginning to think about the solutions. And we're really excited to be able to present that um, within the assessments as well. Yeah, we're hugely, hugely optimistic, I would say. Do you have uh, maybe an example um, from your own work? The story around the Asian hornet within the UK has been an incredible success story. You know, mm-hmm. We think of insects as being really challenging to manage. We knew, for example, when the harlequin ladybird arrived in the UK, there was nothing we could do about it. it has such a high reproductive rate and so dispersive. And so we knew that it was just going to spread. And actually, we engaged people in um, monitoring the harlequin ladybird, but really so that we could learn lessons about that biological invasion. But still, even though we couldn't do anything, I still think there's 
was something so inspiring about the way in which people really got on board. And from that, we learned lessons that we could engage people in recording new arrivals. And that's how in the UK, we then set up the Asian Hornet Watch, as it's called, and online recording and other ways in which people could get involved. And we've then been able to control that particular species and eradicate it within the UK. But I think also, you know, when you look around the world and hear the inspiring stories on small islands where they've managed to eradicate rat populations, for instance, and now the seabird populations on those islands are really thriving. I think those kind of examples are really, really amazing. And we also have you know, amazing stories of um, biosecurity around the world, of people um, putting in place some very simple campaigns that everyone can take part in, for example, checking, cleaning and drying their equipment if they're using a lake for swimming in or kayaking or whatever, or angling, that they can take some really simple biosecurity steps. And so I think all of these, in some ways, quite simple measures are things that give us hope. So many times it is just those small things that happen daily, Um, but it all takes awareness, which is what's so exciting about something like an assessment on this And which is why I, for one, uh, cannot wait to see all the incredible work that you have done. So thank you so, so much for joining us and for sharing a little bit of this story. My pleasure. Great interview, Britt. Helen is one of the IPIS experts who I always find so inspiring. She's got such an amazing amount of hope and enthusiasm And she's so focused on solutions and in some rather difficult areas in in terms of addressing issues and repairing damage to our environment that that are really significant. Oh, definitely. It's also really good to hear how individuals are able to take some actions themselves at a personal level to address the spread of invasive species and to help protect biodiversity. What do you do, Brooke, when you're out hiking or kayaking? So it, it really comes down to, just as Helen said, this sort of biosecurity, just awareness, just cleaning off the side of a kayak if you've been in one water body before or moving to another, you know, checking your pants if you're walking through a place where potentially there is there are seeds or something else uh, from a plant species to move back and forth. You know, humans move globally and it's just remaining aware of, yeah, what's on us and, and what we potentially have touched and taken with us to the next point. And Ippus is often asked when we do these big global science assessments, what about me as a person or my community or my family? What can we be doing? Oh, exactly. And I mean, sometimes these problems have arisen because of things people thought were going to be solutions. So using some species to, again, address something else. And then there are sometimes these unforeseen consequences. So you have an introduction with good intent, but it actually ends up threatening the environment that they were actually imagined to protect. And this is where it gets really tricky. Now, Dr. Maria Loreto Castillo is a postdoctoral researcher and botanist who's looked closely at exactly this and has actually discovered how some invasive species have even become treasured despite the damage they cause. One of the most interesting things is sort of how relative it can be as far as values. One thing in one place is considered native and in another place is considered non-native or even invasive. Um, Do you have any examples of species like that where you have this this change in how we view them? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think that, well, the important thing of invasive is like they are defined because it's uh, a species that are moved by humans. And most of them has negative, or they have a negative impact where they have to be moved. But yeah, there are many invasive species who are like actually under conservation issues sometimes in the native areas. So for example, for my PhD, I was working with these uh, mesquite trees. They native from the Americas and they were moved to Africa to um, help for agroforestry and forestry projects. And it's interesting because, for example, in, in, in the native area, they have been used for so, so long. So there the indigenous people have been using it for different things. And then because of that, it was so much, there was so much use that now there are, some of these species are under conservation issues. But then where they were moved in Eastern Africa, in this case, for example, in Kenya, they become such a problem that people was asking me, like, 
okay, you really should stop this species because we don't want it here. It's just like, it's just problems. And the government bring these species, but um, at the beginning was good, but now it has such a like negative impacts. And then when I was like doing field work in Argentina and Chile, they will ask, okay, what you are doing? And I was like, no, I'm taking samples of mesquite. I said, like, yes, yes, that is so good. You should protect them. We didn't need them. I don't know what happened. And I, <laughs> I was like, yeah, I don't know. I really want that this information can be used, but it was such a contrasting point of view. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You say, okay, how do we save it? How do we kill it? <laughs> totally yes. different. So in Ethiopia, they call it the devil tree, for example. <laughs> and, oh my gosh. And then... Yes, there's a devil tree and people really don't like them. And then in, in the native and Argentina and other places, they are, they're so important for them. They have a so, so long history of use. So they really don't want them to disappear. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That is just fascinating. And it sounds like there are different uses. For example, um, the values that they might have in one place could be different than the other based on how they're used by people. Um, what are the uses of that tree example you just gave? What are some of those those benefits in its native range? It's because these trees have been called the one that can survive where anything else can. So they grow up in really arid and semi-arid regions. And of course, the people have the animals and they need uh, to get, uh, they need food for their livestock. So in the native area, they're really useful for this. And also people use them for shaku and uh, if you see like the arid land and you see this tree, you go there and you can like be protected by, from the sun. And that was the reason that was like, oh, this is like really like magic tree that you can carry to these areas and you can help these places in Africa where there's like so much soil erosion. So you want to take this tree there and try to help people. Then it was like considered like a quick a solution because there was so much need for this. But then, yeah, it was like planted like massively in so many places and there was some like uh, so much selection of the best trees and then there were like a species from everywhere going there and they got mixed. So people at the beginning uh, perceived the benefits of them, but then like actually now they're expanding too much and they're getting into my garden and now I cannot move my animals to the river and now I cannot cross or use the land where I used to, or all my generation, for example, in, in case of like nomadic people, they cannot move anymore through there because the tree has such a, such a big thorns. So uh, generally this perception is like mostly related with uh, how we use nature. And in the native area, they are really like vulnerable because of this, but they in the invasive region, they become such a huge problem that even when they can use them, the negative impact were much, much higher than any positive one. So yes, yeah, definitely related with how we perceive them. And I think even the emotional connection can be a huge part of that, specifically when we think about animals instead of plants, those charismatic species that some people just absolutely love, you know, because they're adorable or because they're, oh, they're so cute. I love that thing. Right. Uh, it's even easier to get kind of locked into that idea. For example, I think about beavers here in, in North America. Um, they are ecosystem engineers. We consider them keystone species. They are considered critical for the building of of systems. And also, we just love them. Uh, but I think beavers are probably considered uh, differently elsewhere. I think you might know a little bit about that. Yeah, there's such a big problem in Patagonia, in Argentina and Chile, because some people thought that they can make like a really like a profitable economic activity from them. They established like they, they brought some, I don't know, around 20 individuals in the 90s to Argentina, Patagonia for industry. But then it didn't really work and then they uh, escape and they reproduce and they spread in everywhere. So yeah, so now they have like such a big impact there. But I must say that uh, now it's like a, these two countries, Argentina and Chile, they're trying to stop and control this species. But now it's so difficult because I've been so long since this started and they uh, spread and, and reproduce and invade everywhere like so quick that now it's like a huge problem. But I think that I read in some place that and um, some study that even if they ask the people like, 
they still find them cute. Uh, and then only they see the negative impact that affecting them, them directly, uh, they can maybe change their opinion. For example, I was reading that it's like some ski resort that is called uh, Beaver Ski Resort Castor. So uh, <laughs> people still um, appreciate them and... And they don't see the, maybe, I think that one occasion was like, there was such a big problem because of this big dam that one city until it, they didn't have electricity because okay. it was everything just destroyed. Uh, but yeah, I think that definitely um, uh, depends on perception, but also uh, how connected the people is with their environment where they are. I guess that many people don't know how much, how many problems these species are creating for the ecosystem. It's difficult sometimes to create that awareness about how negative the impact of these species are. How does some of this research look in practice? What is it like to to do research into invasive ecology? I think that is as excited as any research in ecology always think. It's just that you are trying to get information of a species that people don't want, <laughs> don't wonder. Or they don't want, they don't know what to do with them, or you want them to do something about them, but they don't really care. So it's a lot of effort and make it like rewarding if you see that some of the results have actually been used. For example, in the case of my PhD, where I was working with with Mesquite, uh, I had like such a cool experience in Kenya where I spent like long time there. And it was like unforgettable to be going constantly for the three years of my PhD visiting the same families and and they will wait for me the next season and then well if I go they will I don't know sometime receive me with like white uh, tea and show me the kids and and like like then you get another perception it sounds like an incredible experience and we are so excited about the assessment thank you so much for joining us So, Rob, there you have it, the unintended consequences, both positive and negative, of introduced species. You know, who would have thought that with beavers, people would just absolutely take them into their hearts in Latin America, where they actually cause so much destruction? Yeah, I'm probably going to be really dating myself here, so... (laughs) Speed dating yourself? Not speed dating myself, carbon dating myself. (laughs) Listening to Loretto, I kept thinking back to a movie that I remember from, I think it was the mid-80s. It was about some sort of an alien species that it was cuddly and fluffy and people brought it into their homes. And I think if you fed it at a certain time, it transformed into some sort of a deadly threat. Do you know the one that I'm talking about? Oh, my. You are totally bringing gremlins into gremlins. this, aren't you? That's it. Gremlins. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm bringing gremlins in because to me, it takes me back to that, that image where people should know better. And you'd think by now we would have realized that there are unintended consequences with species and, and that it's not just the stuff of science fiction, right? Right. But it makes for really good science fiction, like <laughs> the trouble with... Triffles? What's the the Star Trek uh, original? Tribbles. Tribbles. That's right. The Tribbles Tribbles, on Star Trek. There it is. I knew there was some alliteration there. So, I mean, what is the answer to this? What should we do with these invasive species? Well, clearly, some are a real problem for us in in real life. Uh, You know, rats and other species that really they can eliminate indigenous plants and animal lives in some of their habitats. But I think that kind of goes back to Helen's research, that knowledge, that awareness, and that monitoring gives power to understanding and dealing with some of these issues. Big time and involving multiple stakeholders, as we have discussed during this season and also just throughout the work of IPIS and this wider community. You know, there are going to be different needs based on the different groups that are impacted. As we heard, you can have something totally different in one region as far as the values of a species and even their potential, you know, use or benefit that is then totally upended in a place where they have been introduced by people. That's really tricky. It's a really nuanced issue. I mean, we're talking about particularly difficult problems in some parts of the world where some communities have a very strong attachment or even a bond to a particular species that may not be a native species, and that for other communities, that species may be a real problem, and to try and reconcile some of these issues and these values. Right. And that species itself didn't ask to be moved and doesn't necessarily know it's somewhere different. It's simply trying to exist. It's trying to live and do its best. And, you know, as Helen mentions, this is clearly a potentially good news story. There is hope and there is optimism. 
in thinking about how to manage and deal with a problem that humans have caused. Humans move, and that means other species move. And again, this is why for me it is so exciting to have an assessment, to have such carefully done intentional work on the subjects with all of these different experts to talk about these very real conflicts of values and needs when considering these and also just all of the species of life on Earth. And that's it for this edition of Nature Insight, Speed Dating with the Future. I'm Britt Garner. And I'm Rob Spall. Next week, in the final episode of Season 3 of this podcast, we're going to be looking at how young people are increasingly taking leading roles on environmental issues, and specifically what that means for IPPUS and the science of biodiversity. In the meantime, you can learn more about IPPUS's work on www.ippus.net or on any of their social media channels. Just search for at IPPUS, that's at I-P-B-E-S. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back next week. Thank you.